fan of the French Connection? Yes. I'm pretty much a fan of pretty much anything. All of his movies. I watched this one the other day. Um, it's him and Lee Marvin. It's called Prime Cut from 1972. Mm-hmm. You ever hear this movie? Yeah. That's that's a pretty uh I always like going back and trying to find, you know, some of the more deeper movies. Um Night Moves is another one I enjoy a lot. Arthur Penn, 1975. Um, even in the Birdcage, I thought he was ridiculously pretty awesome. Well, you know me, I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan, so I loved him in the Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, he's got that was one of my favorite performances of his. Some of those um quotes in the movie that he says we went after i saw it in the movie theater um i i quoted them way too way too way too much especially the interactions between you know him and um angelica houston and danny glover danny, yeah when you call him you know, i've called i've called a lot of people cold trains since then. oh yeah i mean it's it's good yeah. it's, cla- it's classic um but today you've decided we're going to talk about gene and the conversation what a classic movie this is. It is. Um, Francis Ford Coppola, um, 1974 movie, um, comes out between The Godfather and The Godfather 2. Want to give a little background really quick on the movie? Yeah, so this was originally written uh, for the screen by Francis Ford Coppola in 1966. And he wanted to make it back then, but he didn't have the finances to do so. So... The good thing about The Godfather being as successful as it was, was it gave him the opportunity to make this movie finally. So, so it's, it's cool. It's one of those, like, uh, because you had success in one area, you got to make something, which I actually think this movie is just as good as The Godfather or The Godfather Part Two. I think it's it's a different movie, of course, but... What well, that, that's honestly for. why I chose to do this one, because it was a very different type of Gene Hackman movie. Yeah. In the sense that uh, he usually plays very strong, boisterous characters. Even the movies leading up to this one, you know, the movie you mentioned, Prime Cut, and uh, Scarecrow, French Connection... You know, movies of that nature. Even Poseidon, um, adve- even in Poseidon. Poseidon Adventure, yeah. So he's, you know, they're different characters, but they're very, I guess they're very strong characters. Oh, yeah. And, and in this movie, he kind of plays a weaker guy in a way. Who's what kind, I always kind think of about that I, that I didn't bring up in the beginning is him in uh, Bonnie and Clyde. You know, he's, mm-hmm. pretty, tough, he's pretty tough in that movie compared to, to this movie. Yeah, he had a small role in that one, but... um. Still, it was it was the same. Because it was a very strong character, so this was the first time he kind of diverted from that in any mainstream film, and uh, that's kind of why I wanted to go with it. Because even though I know we've talked about this movie before, but there's a lot of people who really haven't seen this and don't know about it, uh, even though it was nominated for uh, Best Picture, and. It's something that, you know, if you're if a fan of Gene Hackman, uh, you should definitely see because he does some things that he doesn't do in other movies. And, no, oh, go on, sorry. You no, know, I was going to say, Gene Hackman, I mean, a lot of people always are always go for the De Niro's and the Pacino's first. But, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, guys like Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman, I think they could mm-hmm. hang all day with those with De Niro and, and Pacino. Yeah, there's never been a bad performance. Gene Hackman's never been bad in anything he's done. And not only that, he's always been very good in everything he's done. Probably the best on screen in every movie he's in, you know? Well, I mean, even movies, I mean, they're not, you know, I, him and Get Shorty, he's ridiculous. Yeah, I love it. That's another one. I love the role of Tenenbaums, and I also love his character, Harry Zim, <laughs> in Get Shorty. That's one, one of, that's one of my favorite, you know, underrated comedies. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely good. You know, a movie uh, I hadn't watched until recently for the first time and he's really good in is like Mississippi Burning. Um, he's pretty good even in something like The Firm. Um, you know, and he plays all sorts of roles, but look, he's, yeah. he's, you know, the bad guy or the good guy or yeah. whatever. Um, but he's always, he's always a very, his character is always a very, like Mississippi Burning, for instance, a very strong character. Um, but this movie in particular, he kind of plays something different. So he had to play it different. So it, it, it's cool because, again, 
the movie is a lot more quiet than it is, you know, action, which I think is what one of it, what makes it awesome personally. Because in the time when I watched it, you know, I'm watching it surrounded by other movies like loud gangster movies and stuff like that. And it doesn't play that way, which is, you know, I, I enjoy in his role is he's especially uh, quiet in this movie. Um, you know, he's everything that you would expect from from the role in which he is he is playing, which is, um, you know, is Harry Call is his name in this movie. Um who's pretty much a quiet guy you would say right oh he's very he's a very reserved character and they they kind of bring that out in uh the first you know half of the movie kind of what he is and because i mean even like you know his girlfriend in the movie who only gets you know doesn't have much screen time but it's terry gar uh he you can tell but his relationship with her you know it's he's just very it's not much interest there it's kind of he, he's kind of just all his life is is his work. Well, he's just you know, and that that's what the movie is is a lot is the work, and he's giving himself a hundred, you know, a hundred percent from it. Here's a little clip from the movie here. Come on, I got that nice wet French kiss now. Come on, a nice wet one there. Pay attention to your recording. Coming in loud and clear. Look, you see him, the man with the hearing aid, like Charles. Where? Right there with the shopping bag. You know, and like most of these scenes, he's silent, and that's why it's hard to get a really good long talking, which is what I think his face, like, is just really stoic in this movie. And it's funny because, uh, well, not funny as in ha-ha, but interesting yeah. that, that the woman you heard there was uh, Cindy Williams, who just passed away recently as well. I knew you were, you're were. you always really good at, at knowing all the good little things like that. And you're definitely right. That was Cindy Williams. Um, just this, you know, within, I think it was about January 25th, she passed away, which yeah. was about a week and a half ago. Um, there's a lot of little, you know, interesting <clears throat> performances in this movie from other actors. You, know, you got Harrison Ford. Um, you know, you even have Robert Duvall a little bit in the movie. Yeah, you get Harry, each of them for you know, you get, actually you get it's, it's odd that you get more Harrison Ford than you do Robert Duvall, you know, in know. his early seventies, you know. But yeah, you get a little bit of both of them. I always think of Robert Duvall. I'll never forget if it was like freshman year of high school, and we watched *To Kill a Mockingbird*, and when he showed up on screen with the white hair, I just started laughing super loud for some unknown reason in class. You know, um, Duvall shows up pretty quiet in the what is it? Bullet, I think, is that the one where mm -hmm. he's in the telephone booth really quick? Really interesting. He's another one who I think is reminds me a lot of like a Gene Hackman type of um, actor, but uh, really, really good movie. Um, the conversation, yeah, it's uh, he and the thing about this too, and the reason why I chose it because Gene Hackman is not really a method actor by any means, mm -hmm. he's never claimed to be, and no one's ever really said he was, but he kind of had to be a little bit because this was not his personality. And like we pointed out a little, you know, a few minutes ago, like he is always playing loud, boisterous characters, whereas this one's something completely different. So he was kind of this way, like Francis Ford Coppola even said, he was kind of this way on the set and kind of stayed this way in character because. This is something so different from what he was used to doing. But he did say, you know, Gene Hackman did say this is his favorite movie to make. I mean, it's, you know, I, and I'll I, give I, Francis Ford Coppola a lot of credit. Like, this is not filmed, you know, after the success of The Godfather, like, this, this was not filmed in any any way, shape, or form like The Godfather. This was more like a, a Robert Altman movie, you know? Like, it was more like MASH than it was, you know, when it comes to actual camera work and shots and stuff like that. So I'll give Francis Ford Coppola a lot of credit for, uh, you know, kind of, you know, going a different direction the way he wanted the movie filmed because he knew what he was filming, and he didn't need he couldn't film this movie the same way he filmed something like The Godfather. But speaking yeah, of Godfather, you know, John Cazale's in this movie. Oh yeah, you, should... you know, we got to absolutely mention him. He's the only guy that's ever he did what five major movies and was and every one of them was nominated for Best Picture. Before he died, you know, he he's out. That's pretty ridiculous. We we did a little bit a, a little bit on the show a while ago where I tried to imagine movies that he could have been in down the road if he was still alive, like 
performances other actors would have taken that he definitely would have been in if he was still alive. I like thinking of things like that because he's he's one of my definite favorites. And he's aw- he's I like his performance in this movie quite a lot. Um, yeah, he does. He does. I mean, he, I, I kind of wish he got a little more screen time than he did, but you know, that's true was, too. It worked. That's true too. But you know, you know you we, always... we were talking the other night. You know, we, there's there's movies where, and this is just you and I in particular, where we can watch movies where it's just pretty much two people talking in a room for two hours. We could be okay with it. Now they're not in the same room for two hours, but this movie is like one of those movies where it's just straight dialogue. You know. There's nothing, you know, the art direction, cinematography, like, you know, it's not something you really that you think about in this film. It's just the interaction between the characters themselves. So. Frederick Forrest, who's in the movie, too, he does a pretty good job. He was in four Francis Ford Coppola movies. Um, he does a good job. I think that's who they're, not that, I think that that is exactly who they're recording in the movie. Mark, he's like on a lot of the, um, on the film thing. It's, I just think the movie plays pretty well especially if you put it with the godfathers and apocalypse now in the 70s it's definitely you know one of coppola's top strongest movies i would say yeah and and when you think of francis ford coppola you think of generally the godfather apocalypse now and this was in between you know those movies well not 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 it was was before the godfather part two came out in four as well but um but you think of those movies and you think of Francis Ford Coppola, you don't really think of the conversation. It kind of gets lost in the mix and the shuffle of it all, which is kind of a shame. But considering, just look at the stars and look at the director of it, you would, you would think that this was a movie that people talk about all the time, but it's, it's just not. And that's probably because, you know, like you said, it, it takes someone, you need an attention span for this one. But, you know, it, it's not one of those things where you're going to see a lot of explosions, a lot of, you know, Oh my God! There's a huge plot twist. I mean, there's a little bit of a plot twist at the end, but like, there's, it's about the about. It's mainly about Gene Hackman himself, his conscience, you know, of what he does, and how he deals death throughout the movie and how it affects him. Yeah, and I think that's really it's a good like as you said it's it's a really good, you know he it's a, for somebody not being a, a method actor you know it's a very he does a very good job at, at, in a character study. Um. Yeah, I did see in this movie too. Like uh, Michael Higgins was in this, and Michael Higgins was uh, he was in a handful of movies. But I remember him. The first time I saw him was in uh, he was in School Ties. Oh yes, remember he was the uh, I'm not sure exactly what they call it because it was still like it was a prep school, so it wasn't a a university, so it wasn't like the dean or anything. But he was like that, you know, the head of the school. He's 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 been he popped up in quite a little. Quite a quite a few. Yeah, he's a good character actor, and I'm like, I forgot Michael Higgins, Higgins was even in this movie when I, when I watched it again. But yeah, he's in it as well. So a lot of cool people pop up in it. Did you ever see? Um, because I have not. Um, Michelangelo Antonioni's blow up from 1966. No, I've never. No, seen no, 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 no. This one. is what Coppola cited as a key influence for this movie. But um, maybe I'll check that out at some point. But you know, it, it, it's. Like you said, it, it's really good for the time too, because uh, Coppola also stated I was reading that he was shocked that some of the same equipment they they used was the same equipment that was used in the Watergate scandal. Yeah, the Nixon administration used the same type of equipment <laughs> by their political opponents, and the th- and the funny thing was that this was all kind of all by accident when it came out because when he filmed this, like th- that scandal really didn't break yet. So it's not like he's like, oh, well, this happened. So now I'm going to, you know, do this. So it might have helped some interest. The movie didn't do that well at the box office. They made a little, what, four and maybe four and a half million or something like that. But yeah, it made a little four and a half, you know. Yeah. But you know. in the ensuing years, it did help it a bit after this whole thing broke because well, a lot of that stuff, the technology, and he, he thought about this, like I said, back in 1966. So they had that type of technology back then. But yeah, when the whole Watergate scandal happened, like everyone kind of, put it together like oh well he made this movie on the heels of this which he really didn't but it did kind of help push it a bit don't don't want to be don't want to be disrespectful to the some of the current uh, crop but I, I feel like if this movie had been released uh this year um it definitely would be a strong contender for a best picture winner um you know i know 75 was a uh 
was Godfather 2 won Best Picture. And of course, you know, that wasn't going to, the conversation wasn't going to beat Godfather Part 2 or Chinatown. Um, but definitely today, I think it would be a, a it's one. Of, it's way better than some of the movies that are out there today. So definitely got to yeah. check out the conversation. But uh, we now are going to move on to an actress in which you picked. Really awesome actress, which we've been doing every show. And that is the great Jamie Lee Curtis. Very awesome pick. It was um, I don't even know how I came up with that. I was driving in a vehicle. <laughs> hey, you know what I like is For the some reason, reason why I do this is I don't see too many. Like it's always again, Pacino, De Niro. There's so many great actresses out there. Um, I'm going to play you a clip from one of my favorite performances with her, and let's see if you um, know what movie this is from. Here, here's the clip. You stupid jerk! Don't ever call me stupid, and I'm not jealous. Then leave. Okay. A nice place. I know you know what that's from. So that is her talking to Kevin Klein in a fish called Wanda. I don't know. It's one of my favorite Jamie Lee Curtis movies. It's Jamie Lee Curtis is amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. sometime down the road we'll have to get back together. I I have I don't know why, but I just really think Kevin Klein is also really awesome. So do I. I. I mean. In so many movies, um, a movie that I watched again recently that I didn't watch when I was younger in the last year, but just him and Sophie's Choice. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, the movie itself, it's a pretty good movie, but he's got a haunting performance. But back to Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, her performance in Fish Called Wanda, amazing. And that's the thing, like most people think of her in, obviously, in Halloween. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the first thing that pops up, but I think her comedic roles are stronger than anything she does drama wise um she was and obviously she was in fierce creatures which was not a sequel of fish called wanda but was also kind of the yeah. same ass and stuff you know involved with some uh, guys from monty python michael palin and uh john cleese um and she was terrific i thought she was the best i thought she of all the performances and knives out i thought hers was the strongest oh yeah she they were like they were all good. Like Michael Shannon was great, Don Johnson was great. Every, you know, everyone was great in that. But I think she was. She kind of she didn't steal the show, but she. But hers was like I laughed harder at some of the stuff that she said than anybody else. Oh yeah, you know. So she she's pretty versatile, and uh, like. I mean, but she plays. You know, I was never a huge Halloween guy, so I never really. I was kind of like yeah, whatever. And then you know they made more and more and more, and all the time. I kind of I kind of didn't even watch those. She was good. Remember that movie, um, Forever Young with Mel Gibson? And oh, Robert yeah. Wood? Yeah, she was. Oh, and, yeah. And George Wendt, our friend George Wendt from Chicago. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Right. And uh, she was good in that, you know, in a, in a dramatic piece. But, yeah, her comedic roles, I think, are definitely far and away better. Even in True Lies, like. Oh, she's great in True Lies. She's, yeah. And, like, you know, her interactions, like, it's. Not really. I mean, it's sort of a comedy, but it's not. Like her parts were all pretty funny, you know. Was, so yeah, she's a pretty versatile actress, and she's done it for a long time. She's kind of good. Uh, definitely a uh, good pedigree coming. You know, being the daughter of Janet Lee and Tony Curtis. Uh, right before coming on here on Showtime, I was uh, trading places. Was on. She's great. Oh yeah. Tra- I got to all about trading places. She's great in trading places. You know, I know it's cheesy for what it is, but you know, 1991, same year, uh, the year before Forever Young. I mean, her. It's a smaller role, but her and my girl, um, with Macaulay Culkin, she even shows up in there. It's it's a light it's a light performance, but she's she's always like. Um, she was good and uh, uh it didn't get good reviews at all and no one really liked it much. I kind of did. It was uh Drowning Mona. Oh yeah. With Danny DeVito yeah. and I mean that that movie that hurt like, that movie was pretty funny. And she was good in that one. Same year as um um what do you call that? Uh Fish Called Wanda, a dramatic performance that I enjoyed her in was uh, Dominic and Eugene. Um oh, I remember we talked about that one. Yes, that that's how I thought. I, I didn't want us to make I thought we did, but uh she again in that movie she's just like plays ray liotta's girlfriend mm-hmm. and 
just really imagine Jamie. Like I always like imagining people in movies like pairing up. So you imagine Jamie Lee Curtis playing, you know, you know, she's she's the girlfriend to this guy right here. They were all over the house. Heroin that was worth sixty thousand dollars. I need that money. That's all we got. What was I supposed to do? The Heroin. They were in everything. That's all the money that we had, Karen. I was dependent on that. Why did you do? <laughs> that's my favorite that's one of my favorite quotes to use around the house when anything's due but uh just just imagining ray Liotta and her doing that but uh a lot a lot of roles a lot of different roles um catherine bigelow she's got a movie from 1990 called blue steel um where jamie lee curtis plays a police officer in that movie. Oh, yeah. pretty, pretty hard pretty hardcore movie she's pretty good in that movie um but True Lies, I think, is definitely, as you stated, a peak. Um, as the Halloween movies went along, they definitely these new Halloween movies too. Uh, she, she was, she was, she was okay in them, but they weren't to me some of the best movies. And I do like some of those movies, but you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is just pretty much, you know. Have you watched this one that she's uh, nominated for? this year no i haven't seen that everything either. everywhere all at once uh unique uh, definitely a unique movie experience um i have read about it. I, honestly i did read the plot synopsis and it's a very unique uh because it, it, oh yo's in it and uh yeah yeah it's been on showtime i i haven't really see, see uh you know uh we've had some people on who like it and we have some people who don't like it and it's pretty you know it's to me it's somewhere you may like it you may not it might not be your acquired taste it could be but she's actually really good in it um she's not in it a whole lot but she does a really good job actually everyone in the movie does a whole good job it's just more of the um the script it is cool what's his name is in the movie from the goonies um oh what was his name oh i'm looking it up right here k he kwan he was in uh like Short round and yeah, short in, round and uh, Temple of Doom. Yeah, he's in a couple other little things. He's making a he's making a comeback in that movie, so that was pretty pretty cool. But yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis, man, she's good. It was a good pick. Um, before we go on to our last little thing, I got a little. I got four movies here, four DVD movies that I'm going to ask you really quick, and let's see what your. Um, if you like these movies or you do not like these movies or you've never seen these movies. Okay, okay. movie number one. Forbidden Planet. Love Forbidden Planet. Actually, Let's Forbidden Planet, time. when we did a podcast the first time. I know. You I did it. mention this one. You did mention it. Because it was a very it was an inspiration for Star Trek and it, it was kind of weird because it, it was the first time I've ever seen Leslie Nielsen in a serious role. Um, but I love Forbidden Planet. That's one of those movies that you know, I quiz you on this. Like, I don't mean to quiz you, but then I'm quizzing you to see if you remember what you said on past shows. And you're good because you did say that. And um, definitely Leslie Nielsen in a classic, classic performance. Yeah, well, Walter Pigeon's in that one and Francis. There's there's a few name actors in that one. That was one of the very first, like, well, that was the first, I don't know if that was the first uh, technical or science fiction film. It might have been, but. Really, really. But yeah, that was a good one. Really, really good. Um, second up here, I've never asked you, what is your opinion of The Natural? That is my all-time favorite sports movie. Wow. Hands down. I never knew that, and it's definitely in my top three. I love, that I love with The Natural. The, the cast, the story, the way, um, the art direction in that. You got it. Um, I even know that like in, it was filmed. Now, that movie... Their night stadium was actually the old War Memorial Stadium in Buffalo, where the actual the Buffalo Bills used to play there when they were in the AFL. And it's been torn down since then, but they still had the facade up of the stadium itself. And it, if you you can't really tell in the movie they did a good job of covering it up, but it's really like an oval. And the outfield wall that Bump Bailey crashes through, there's a huge gap between that wall and the stands. I mean, a huge gap. You don't notice it because the way it's shot. But you know, but the supporting actors, I mean Robert Duvall, Robert oh, Broski. Logan. I mean, um, dude, they're, they're, they're it's all fant that the whole movie is just brilliant to me. Will I, my, I, I mean he's great in it. I had my fiance Richard Farnsworth in that too. Uh yeah. I had my fiance watch it for the first time a few months ago. 
am. But that's yeah, that's my father always loved that movie. Me too. And so I watched it a lot when I was young. And I, that, that that is just in I'm a huge Robert Redford fan. So to me, me, like, me that's, uh, it, it was one of the things that I would always remember. And I, like it was day I was six, seven, eight, and throughout the rest of my life, the television in the other room, you would hear it at the end. It would go up always to like to the level that you couldn't even hear yourself. And I would walk in the room and it was like literally kind of my, I would say my first experience to like really taking in baseball. Mm -hmm. And he was really like, his face is watching this movie. Like he's watching like the most serious thing he's ever seen. And Redford's at the plate and that whole ending, man, it really could almost, it it brings emotion to me every time I think. And And that's why I get, and that's why sometimes when people put it down so quickly online, I try to refrain from saying nothing because the movie actually means quite a lot to me because that feeling at the end, I think is what I feel about baseball altogether. Um, I, uh, yeah. The, the part, the most emotional moment in that film to me is when he's actually talking to Glenn close in the hospital room just before the final games. It's the whole yep. thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I even have a Roy Hobbs Jersey. I did buy one because I'm that crazy. Glenn Close, I think it was the first episode of this uh, thing I did. She was the one that I, I picked. I I love Glenn Close quite a lot. And I don't even often think of her in this movie. I don't know why, because um, she's amazing in this movie. I think she's more amazing in this movie than Kim Basinger, um, even though Kim Basinger is really good in the movie. No, it's but, one of her first movies, though. So, like, yeah, Glenn I mean, Close was a little more established right by that time. So she was fair. just... That's fair. And I think Glenn Close over honesty is, is probably a better actress anyway, but that's overall, true. but not yeah. the Kim Basing, not the slight Kim Basing or anything, no. but all right. Our next movie from 90 since we've been breaking down 1980s movies, 1983. Have you ever heard of I know you have Twilight Zone the movie? Yep. Got a lot of good cool parts. Uh sadly. Mr. Uh, what's his name passed away in the first part while they were filming it. Nick yeah, Morrow. That, was, that was yeah, Nick Morrow, and uh, which is funny because I just watched him there at night in uh, Blackboard Jungle. He's been with Glenn Ford, but he plays a teenager in that movie. as being back in the fifties, but uh, that that when I read that how that whole thing happened, he died with the two kids in there and everything. That that was crazy. Very scary. Do you know who his daughter is in real life? Oh, maybe I don't know if he's. Jennifer Jason Lee, oh, which, okay. which is crazy because it's like the year before Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Mm-hmm. So you're saying to yourself, like, her rise is somehow, you know, I mean, she has to go through, unfortunately, that because there was a huge lawsuit and everything. I mean, this movie had Spielberg directing an episode. You know, you had you had quite a lot of quite a lot of different things going going on in this movie. It wasn't as a big of a success as it probably should have been. But, yeah, uh, but hey, hey a guy, John Lithgow was in that movie too, which I love. John, he was going to be in a movie we're going to talk about in a minute. Which too. in about two two seconds we'll be talking about. And yeah. also, Scatman Crothers. I love Scatman Crothers. Scatman Crothers is in the, that. That's my least favorite. Uh, it was second episode, stuff, but we broke it down when we did our Spielberg because that's the Spielberg episode. But mm. uh, definitely. Uh, my, uh, my two favorites are, um, the last two, obviously. I mean, John Lithgow's is probably my favorite, but Joe Dante, the one before that with the kid who controls everybody to do yeah. it exactly. Um, because there's some special effects in that, that are really cool. Actually, but I think the, I like Nick Marl's maybe my favorite. I mean, the, the that. idea of that one was yeah. definitely, um, was, was definitely hardcore. And I'm a big fan of the original series of Twilight Zone anyway, so anything Twilight Zone I'll pretty much be watching. Did you watch the remake at all that came out? about? I've watched a couple episodes of it. I mean, they're both good, but I don't know, man. Like, it's, it's, I start getting into things, and I jump into something else, and I jump into something else, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I got to go back to this. Oh, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, 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 it's tough these days. Last movie here. Um polarizing fella these days but i've never asked you what is your opinion on this best picture winner from 1977 i like that movie that was one of i I, here's the thing like i I was never really when i was younger i was never really i never really understood 
the fascination with Diane Keaton. But then the more I watch things with her, I'm like, you know, she's a pretty damn good actress. And, 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 and she helps carry that movie a lot. I know it's a Woody Allen film, but she does really help carry that movie. And they, they really like, that is something where their on screen dynamic is second to none, man. Like, so, I mean, it's a good movie, but again, it's like one of those movies where you have to kind of get that humor. Yeah. And if you don't, you know, you're not going to like it at all. That's true. So That's true. It, it is. And what, I mean, Woody Allen movies are just that way. But are you, are you, do you like his movies? Would you say? I like them. There's some I don't like, but I mean, like, I like them in general, but it's not something I go out of my way to watch or recommend. Honestly. You ever see Sleeper? No, I've never seen Sleeper. Or how about uh, everything you've ever wanted to know about sex? But we're that, crazy. that I've seen. But that haven't guy haven't seen that one. God, it's funny you brought that up. I haven't seen that one in a long time. I mean, these are unfortunately movies that those two movies. Um, they're like the mid seventies. Mm-hmm. You know, they're pretty. They're pretty. They're pretty good. I mean, when Annie Hall comes and after Annie Hall, he he starts doing a lot more Annie Hall. Although I do enjoy his uh, Match Point. I thought that was a really good movie with Scarlett Johansson. Um, yeah, he does, you know, and then crimes and misdemeanors, I thought was, was, was pretty good. Yeah. There was I some mean, stuff like after the seventies, that was good, but it's, it starts getting purple Rose of Cairo was good. I liked purple Rose of Cairo quite a bit, but now we brought our, you favorite. know, we brought ourselves up to our, our, our last point here, which is 2010, the year we made content. What's the message? Message as follows. It is dangerous to remain here. You must leave within two days. What? Do you want me to repeat the message, Dr. Floyd? Who recorded it? This is not a recording. Who's sending it? There is no identification. I don't... Well, first off, before we get started, um, I grew up in a house where this movie was likened more than the original. I know that's sacrilege is probably, but... um, my dad well, really I'm, I, in, in, in a little a bit, I'm going to get to why it's not so sacrilegious. All right. Well, let's let's continue. Give me a little breakdown on your because I just rewatched this movie after you told me this was your pick. So okay. Well, as you're well aware, well aware, and I make it aware, 2001: A Space Odyssey is, is one of my probably, if not my favorite movie of all time, my top three favorite movies of all time, and it's it's definitely I think the best science fiction movie ever made. Now. It, whenever someone reviews this movie, whether it's Cisco and Ebert when it first came out or whoever now makes videos about it, there's no way you cannot compare it to 2001 because it is a direct sequel. And if it wasn't, that's one thing. And, and some of these movie critics say, we well, got to separate that. You know, it's, it's difficult to separate it. But if you want to separate it, you can because 2001 obviously was when it comes to visual effects, um, it was so far ahead of its time. It's just ridiculous. The effects in this movie aren't even as good as the, the what you see in 2001. This movie came out, what, 16 years after that. So in that time, Star Trek came out. Not the show, but the movies mm-hmm. and Star Wars. 2010 kind of played more to that audience than it did to someone who enjoyed 2001 2001 was the book was written and the movie was written basically in conjunction with each other so it was all done at the same time now arthur c clark who wrote the book 2001 and 2010 he wrote the book the ending of it was a little bit different than it was in the movie but and i've never honestly read the book i just read a couple bit bit of the differences but Kubrick, you know, Stanley Kubrick is my favorite director ever. So it's it's difficult to, for me personally to, to say, okay, someone's going to come in and follow up on his movie. They came to him and asked him if he wanted to make a sequel. He wasn't interested in doing it at that time. So they ended up asking a, a guy by the name of Peter yeah. Himes. I didn't even know that. See, that's pretty I didn't know they asked him. They did. And so Peter Himes ended up making the movie. Now, Peter Himes made uh, a couple different space movies, Capricorn 1 and Outland. If you watch Outland, especially, I mean, you can pull up stills like an IMDB or Google or whatever, and some of the stills in Outland look eerily similar 
to some of the things you see in 2010. Oh, oh I mean, the lighting, especially. I, I that was one that I it was one where it was I think it was like 2008 and 2009. I went to my dad and I was like, I need movies that I've never seen before, deep cuts. And he's like, You ever see Outland? And it's again, you're right. It's 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 a lot like 2010. You're absolutely it is I mean, the way it looks. Yes. So Peter Himes had, um, and he actually went to Kubrick and asked Kubrick. He's like, Hey, I want you kind of your blessing to make this film. And Kubrick says, Okay. And he says, Do do what you want to do he says do your thing and go you know and do it as best as you can the way you want to do it so this movie is definitely different than 2001 2001 you can argue about or debate or whatever discuss to the end of time on what happens in the end um the themes of the movie itself i have a strong idea of what they were trying to get at and everything um, but maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? But I, th- I, I think I have a pretty good idea. And this movie kind of doesn't go along with what I think happened in 2001. But that's okay. I'm taking that off off the table. So 2001 is a movie that's more like an artistic. It's it's a ballet. You know, it's visually stunning. It's not a movie where you're going to be like, okay, well, the screenwriting of the script is really strong in this movie. Because it's really not. The characters, the way they interact with each other is very cold. It was meant to be that way. But 2010, what it does, it, it, it pushes the characters themselves, the relationship between each other more. So to give a little background on this, 2010 is, it takes place nine years after 2001. Obviously, you can just figure that out in the title of the movie. In 2001, you, they're, they're, you know, they went on the Jupiter mission. I'm not going to go through the whole plot, but... 2001 um, ends with uh, basically the disappearance of Dave Bowman. They're trying to figure out what happened to him. So 2010 kind of picks up nine years later and and a Russian scientist um, approaches Dr. Haywood Floyd is played by Roy Scheider in this film. He's played by William Sylvester in the first movie. And he says, okay, he kind of gives him a hint where, while the discovery's still out there because they're still tracking the ship that was in 2001 that was around Jupiter and the orbit's changing and things are changing out there. So Haywood Floyd, who feels kind of guilty that he's responsible for what happened to these astronauts that disappeared or were killed in 2001, he feels responsible and he's like, you know, I need to go on this mission to figure out what happened. Now, what the, now the difference is in this movie 2001, for the first 20 minutes of the film, you have no dialogue. It's all, you know, just basically scenery, and uh, you kind of put together what's happening, and then it jumps ahead a millennia, you know, or more than that even, a couple millennia, whatever. But this movie, is, it's, it's what holds this movie back is, as a sequel, it's not going to be as good as, it, as the first movie ever could be. It just can't be. No, I mean, so, it's such a such an inspir it's such a inspiration for so it is, and so but the good, but the good thing Peter Himes did was it made it more character driven. So you That's, have yeah. Russian cosmonauts with American astronauts in this one, in that relationship. Now, back in 1984, when this came out, there were still high tensions in the Cold War, so they kind of mixed that into this film. Yep, and, I, and so what was going on. It was how they interacted with each other, considering what was going on back at Earth when they were kind of on the brink of war. So the, the shots themselves, the visual effects, like I said, they're good in this movie. Don't get me wrong, but putting it up against 2001, I mean, it's oh, it's, it's, it's apples and oranges. No, you, you just can't do it. Right. No, so, you can't. But the cast in this movie is where the strength is. It's because it, it's you know, better than like, much better than the, what they put together in 2001. So you have Roy Scheider, you have Bob Balaban, you have John Lithgow, and you have Helen Mirren. So, and Helen Mirren is an English actress, but she, you know, had to do her Russian accent's kind of sketchy, but, you know, that's <laughs> we neither here nor there. But uh, it's, it's the interactions between them is kind of what pushes this along. But the way they explain why the HAL 9000 malfunctioned. If it was even a malfunction, um, 
is what's kind of like a cheap cop out. I think it was the reason they gave him this, and he still followed, and and Peter Heim still followed what Arthur C. Clarke wrote in 2010. So Arthur C. Clarke's the one that kind of wrote the reason why. And interestingly enough, at that time, you know, there wasn't really email or anything, but they they, they created an actual email type connection, Peter Himes and uh, Arthur C. Clarke, because he wanted to go, he wasn't, he wanted to stay in constant contact of what Arthur C. Clarke was writing and how he was developing the story. So when he was writing the screenplay, Arthur C. Clarke would be like, okay, you know, go this route, or I'm, I'm doing this. So for this, pick, you know, for this scene, you may want to go this route and so on. So it was kind of one of the first, like, you know, international email connections that was ever created back in 1980, well, they were filming in 82, 83. So that, I thought that was kind of interesting that they did that, but. Very interesting. But the characters themselves, like John Lithgow's character, he was the one that built basically the discovery. And then Bob Balaban was the one who, who built and programmed Hal. So he's, and you can tell like his character sounds like Hal. But the way he speaks and his voice patterns and everything are very much like Hal's. He even has a scene um, back on Earth where he's talking to the Sal 9000 computer, who, um, and a lot of things people don't know, uh, one thing people don't know about that is the Sal 9000 was voiced by Candace Bergen. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw. Yeah, so, and it, cool. it kind of just slipped through the cracks there. But if you listen, you're like, oh, yeah, that is Candace Bergen. But, and she sounds like it's just like a female version of Hal. And, the guy who did Hal's voice, Douglas Rain, actually did come back for this movie. Like when you that scene you played a little bit ago of Hal talking to Haywood Floyd, that's Douglas mm-hmm. Rain who played the original Hal. Mm-hmm. Him and Keir Dalea, who was Dave Bowman, the original one, both came back. Him and Douglas Rain are the ones that came back for this movie. And if you notice Keir Dalea, like you know, in the first movie, like I said, they had no personality. Like him and uh, Gary Lockwood who played Frank Poole as co-pilot, it had no personality at all. And this one, like, Keir DeLea was much, now that he's kind of, what's that movie? The movie has a lot, a lot of, I don't, like, that's the thing the movie has more than the first one, is a little more personality, but it doesn't have, because the first movie has all of the, you know, everything that everybody loves. This movie's just, you know, it's a good follow-up, you know, but it's definitely nowhere near the, I think, the original. No, it's nowhere near the original, but like I said, they're, they're completely different. So some people do like this movie better because if you don't have a huge attention span or the patience to see what's going on in front of you and start interpreting those things, the, the first movie is totally is is totally veiled in subtlety. So subtle themes throughout the film. And it's the most brilliant way that you can express what you're trying to in those, you know, the themes you're trying to. But this movie is more of a direct, you know, like a, it's basically more like a Star Trek movie. That's true. You know, so that's, that's why I, that's why I don't knock it, and that's why I don't think it's it's not a bad movie. I don't like the way they explained why Hal malfunctioned. There's some things I didn't like about it, and, and some of the effects, you know, like the like you know on Earth, and you know the Earth scenes, they're using a lot of 1984 technology. Yeah. Whereas you know, so it's dated. Whereas 2001, he did all he could to make it look futuristic for yeah. people walking upside down to the no noise and, you know, in space and things like that. And Kubrick actually had all the, the models and everything destroyed after 2001. Oh, really? I didn't know. So that. they had to rebuild everything for this film and they did a pretty good job of it. Um, the centrifuge actually where Bowman and Poole spent all their time though, they couldn't really recreate it into the budget for it. So that's why you don't see that part of the discovery in 2010. Yeah. And, and there was a, a line, the very last line in the movie kind of, I'm not going to blow it for anybody, it kind of makes me feel weird too because you kind of get the hint that there's aliens involved, like a higher being, you know, higher beings. And then Haywood Floyd says something at the end that hints at something else. And I'm kind of like, oh, I don't mind. He kind of said that. But <laughs> um, true. But either way, it's it's a very, um, it's, it's it, it the pacing is very, is done very well in this movie. And for what it was and what he had to work with, I thought Peter Himes did a fine job. And the, and the cast was great. And at the casting, it was, it was a good job of casting. Roy Scheider, you know, was very good as Haywood Floyd. And uh, John Lithgow, Bob, like I said, Bob Balaban was pretty much the personality of the HAL 9000. So they did a good job of, you know, making him, I guess, making his voice patterns and, you know, everything sound just like HAL. 
but one thing too like you know in the, is, is kind of a error i think it may be an error maybe not a continuity but like in the first movie they say when Hal's being shut down he says my instructor was mr langley which i would think well wouldn't your instructor i mean be dr chandra from the you know from the next movie so i don't know if they're there's one of the little things I caught. I was like, that's not right. But, you know, but either way, 2010 is, is a great movie. I think yeah. um, it's definitely worth watching. If you like Star Trek or Star Wars or things like that, it'll definitely keep your attention for the two hours. It's, it's about a half. It's almost two hours, it's about a half hour less than 2001. 2001 one's only got about 40 minutes of dialogue in a two hour and 20 minute film, which yeah. tells you right there. It's more visually stunning than anything else. Yep. And I love it so much that, so I'm, I'm, I can separate the two movies as a sequel and as an, as a sequel, and it was a way to explain what happened in 2001. It's it to me it does make it, but as a movie itself, um, or, or to carry on the legacy of it, it's okay with me. And Arthur C. Clarke actually wrote you know another book, 2061. He also wrote a book called 3001. Oh, so and I haven't read them, but like you know, it, I've read about them. Like 3001, like it picks up, like they, someone finds Frank Poole still floating in space from the first movie and basically brings the, brings him back to life, reanimates him. I'm gonna have to re- I want to read about those. Those are, these are big novels. Movie. Yeah. So, and then like 2061, you have like a hundred and some odd year old Haywood Floyd that's still in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Cause, you know, cause he's still alive. Yeah. So, but he's in that one. But uh, yeah, definitely. Strong character development in this movie. Great, um, great dynamic between them, uh, between Haywood Floyd and, uh, well, between Roy Scheider and Helen Mirren, and that's the strength of this film. You got if you have to look if you're looking at it as a, as here's what explains what happens, you might be a little bit disappointed, especially people who are real fans of 2001. <laughs>